Good morning and welcome to Bible Fellowship Church in our class on the book of Revelation. Let's begin with a word of prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its encouragement to us, its challenge to us, and its perseverance in our lives to bring change, to bring uh, genuine uh, hope to our hearts. We thank you for it. We thank you for who you are. We thank you that we are going to see your glory in new and exciting and powerful ways in the next couple of weeks as we study heaven and we study the future. We thank you for that. We ask your power to be working through us, through your spirit. I pray that all who hear uh, my voice, be it here in this auditorium or elsewhere via the web, that they will be challenged to walk closer to you, to give their lives to you, and to live for eternity in all that matters. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay. Now, uh, I thought I would give you guys this morning a little bit of a taste of church history. Okay? Uh, this is sort of a tradition in the Hard family. Um, I want to talk to you about a man that I did my doctoral dissertation on and wrote a book about. Uh, about three people have read it. I'm not kidding. One of them was my mother. And uh, so, <laughs> no, I'm, well, my wife had to edit it. <laughs> so she read it uh, and critiqued it and made lots of corrections. Thank you for that. But um, his name's John Frith. And most people haven't heard of him unless you're a reader of Fox's Book of Martyrs in the larger editions in the shorter editions. By the way, there's no such book as Fox's Book of Martyrs originally. What John Fox wrote was a huge 11-volume treatise called Acts and Monuments. Okay, just no extra charge for that. And uh, I actually have a copy of that in my home library. And in that, he catalogs the history of persecution of the false gods against the true believers in Christ. But uh, what he was a genius at is telling the stories of the martyrs of the English Reformation. And so you hear all these great stories. And John Frith is one of those martyrs of that Reformation. And he was a young man. He was only 30 years old when he died. And uh, he was burned alive at the stake in 1533. Now, what was he doing? He was a close associate of William Tyndale and worked with William Tyndale in exile in Antwerp, Holland, or the Low Countries. In those days, today it would be called Belgium. And they were working together on translating the New Testament. They were writing Protestant books and tracts. And Frith came back to England to try to give some leadership to the burgeoning Protestant movement in uh, Henry VIII's England. And unfortunately, he was arrested. He was tried for heresy because England was still at that point in time a Catholic uh, country, or at least a country that held to Catholic doctrine. He was tried for heresy, and the heresy he was tried for was denying transubstantiation. Now, you're a wise group here, and I'm sure you all know what transubstantiation is, right? Okay. Heads are nodding. That's good. For those of you out there who are not with this august group who understand all these difficult terms, transubstantiation is the Catholic dogma that says that when you celebrate communion, that the bread and the wine are transformed into the actual body and blood of Jesus. And so you actually partake of the body and blood of Jesus. And it's complicated. There's a philosophical formula, but that's sort of the upshot of it. And uh, Protestants in general have challenged this idea. And so Frith was arrested, bound, and here is John Fox's illustration from Acts and Monuments, or the Book of Martyrs, of the burning of John Frith. And what's interesting about him is that he was burned with a disciple. You can see the young man here in the back. This guy's name was Andrew Hewitt. 
And he followed John Frith to the flames as a disciple. It's, a, it's an amazing story. He's a, quite a guy. And so Frith and his disciple Hewitt were burned alive at the stake for their teachings of the Word of God. And so notice the date in which he was executed, July the 4th, 1533. And so uh, being as he was the topic of my study, he's one of those people in history. You know, you, you look at some people in history and you start looking closer, you begin to see their warts, you begin to see their problems. The closer I looked at this guy, the more I admired him. So, um, so I want to just remember here, and if I could tie it into what we're talking about today, we're talking about heaven today. Yay! <laughs> All right? And uh, we're going to see that heaven needs to be our focus in our lives. If we're not heavenly focused, we get too wrapped up in this world. And I'll say more about that later on. But these great men and women of the faith, and there are many people today who are suffering for their faith. Right? We hear stories from all over. And uh, many people are being killed for their faith still today. Hopefully, no one's being burned alive at the stake. It's a particularly horrible way to execute someone. But people are suffering today for Christ. And if all we have is this life, then they're fools. But if we're looking for that eternal city, and that eternal home with Christ for eternity, then they're not fools. So, with that having been said, we're going to move on. And uh, let's see. Okay, where did this come from? Okay, there's just a problem with the animation there. Sorry about that. Moving on to the new heaven and the new earth revealed, verses 1 through 6 of chapter 21. So if you'd take your Bibles and turn in the book of Revelation to chapter 21, you know, today's quiz will be when will we get to chapter 23? There is no 23. Okay. That's like 1st Hezekiah 3, right? There is no Hezekiah. All right. So let's begin to unpack this. We left off last week talking about a very sober and somber topic, the topic of the great white throne judgment and the judgment of the unbelievers and their fate. Today we're going to start talking about the new heavens and the new earth. So, we see in verse 21.1, let's read this together. And then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there is no longer any sea. All right. So, let me just get to the right location here. This is the problem with electronic stuff. You have to flip through it here. So I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there's no longer any sea. Now we read that, but you've got to really stop and say, what is this saying? So for us as believers, I think we need to not get too upset about the destruction of the earth. This present world is not permanent. You got that? That's what this is saying here. What I find perplexing is the people who've rejected God and his word, you know them, they're believers in naturalistic evolution, atheists, who are so passionate about saving the planet. Well, you, know, you know who I'm talking about. And they have no real concept of a higher power, and yet they want to save the planet. Their whole life philosophy is based upon the belief that their own existence is a great cosmic accident. I mean, that's what naturalistic evolution is teaching, right? You're here because this, you know, the atoms smashed into one another. They have no explanation of how the atoms got there to begin with, right? The Big Bang. Well, what started the Big Bang? Where did the matter of the Big Bang come from, right? So there's no 
uh, real answer to creation and why we're here and how we're here. We're all products of physical and materialistic chance. They reject the truth as a creator of the universe and our earth, and yet seem to find meaning in efforts to save the planet. Why? If there's no God, there's no resurrection, then Paul said, let us eat, drink, and for tomorrow we die. Right? What possible meaning can there be in saving this planet if it's eventually doomed to sun decay? Right? You know, they tell us, the scientists tell us, that in a couple of billion years or so, our sun will just die out, become a dwarf or something like that. You know? And, of course, then Earth will be all messed up then anyway. Now, so why, you know, th this has always kind of puzzled me, how the illogic of these positions. Of course, now, from a believer's perspective, we know that we're responsible and been given the responsibility by God to care for this world and its creatures. In fact, theologians call this the cultural mandate. It comes from Genesis 1, 28, where it says, when God creates men and women, and he says, rule over the earth, subdue it, and manage it. Well, we've not done a very good job of that, have we? And this would include management of the earth, but our sinfulness, the curse of not only our sin, but the curse on the earth itself, has brought forth all kinds of problems. You know, human greed. People uh, destroy the earth to make a buck, and we don't manage it well. We pursue animals to the point of extinction and all of these things. So I agree with the principles. Yes, we as human beings are responsible to manage this earth and not abuse it. But there is hope. We know that beautiful as this present creation is, it's cursed. Hard to imagine that curse. One of my favorite places in the world is Yosemite Valley. Anybody ever been to Yosemite Valley in California? You got to get there. Get it on your bucket list. It's beautiful. It's one of the most beautiful places you'll ever imagine. Or the Grand Tetons in Wyoming. I like mountains. So, But there's all kinds of wonderful, beautiful places. I've been to the Fos de Iguazu. In, it's basically the Niagara Falls of South America. Amazing. Right, these, these things that God has created. But this is a world where there's a curse. Imagine a world where there's no curse, no sin to destroy and abuse it. That is what is coming. See. The only detail is we're given here is that there will no longer be any sea. Now notice, it also says a new heaven and earth then this new earth is not going to have any sea. It's going to be different. As Forrest Gump said, it's a whole nother earth. All right, thank you. That one just went shh. All right. I guess Forrest Gump is out of our memory banks now. But uh, it's going to be radically different. And I think it's going to be so cool, it's going to blow our minds. And there's even those who interpret these verses that say, maybe the present universe will be completely done away with. Now, I looked at this a little bit last week. We, we talked that Peter said that this present world is going to be burned up with fire and, and there'll be a new world. So this is not just said in the book of Revelation. There are many of the prophets who looked ahead and said this present world, this present existence is not the permanent one. And that's encouraging. And so, if you stop and you think about it, how big is God? Right? We, if you think of the universe and the enormity of the universe and that that may be temporary. That may just be here for now and there's going to be a new one. And we don't have a lot of detail about what it's going to be like. So what we're going to see a little more detail on is this new city of the new world that's created. So we then see this new Jerusalem descending from heaven 
in verse 2. Let's read that together. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. So we're introduced to the capital of our new existence. This is Jerusalem number three. Okay, let me take you through that if you're wondering what I mean. The first Jerusalem is the present Jerusalem. It's been around now for nearly 4,000 years. The actual prehistoric city where Jerusalem is, the first indication of that in existence is during the life of Abraham. If you remember when Abraham came back from the slaughter of the kings, Melchizedek, this is really Bible trivia here, if you know who Melchizedek is. How many of you know who Melchizedek is? You're blessed. Okay. Remember that Melchizedek, king of Salem, and Melchizedek, the name means king of righteousness, right? Melech is the Hebrew word for king. Sedek is the uh, Hebrew word for righteousness. So Melchizedek, king of Salem, comes down from what eventually is going to be the city of Jerusalem and gives to Abraham bread and wine. Very interesting analogies here. And then blesses Abraham, and Abraham then turns around and gives him a tenth of all of the spoil of the battle that he had just won. Okay, The author of Hebrews makes a big deal out of that in chapter 7 of the book of Hebrews. Uh, Melchizedek's mentioned, I believe it's in Psalm, is it 2 or 110? Anyway, so, uh, but Jerusalem goes all the way back to the days of Melchizedek and Abraham nearly 4,000 years ago. Okay. But we, as we saw in the Great Tribulation, that Jerusalem itself is going to undergo a great earthquake, the city is going to be split. Uh, so we believe that as Jesus reigns on the earth, remember, we're premillennial. We believe that there's going to be a literal kingdom for a thousand years and so forth, that Jesus is going to reign in a new Jerusalem or at least a rebuilt Jerusalem, probably a repaired Jerusalem and that the world, after all the ravages of the Great Tribulation, will probably be restored some of the curse may be removed and fixed, but it's still going to be the same earth that we know. It may be reconfigured somewhat. Remember the great earthquake was going to flatten the mountains and raise up the islands and so forth. So we're not sure exactly what the topography of the new earth is going to be. It will be improved and changed, but it will still be the same earth. What we're talking about here is a new Jerusalem, a completely new creation that comes down from heaven. So as this third Jerusalem comes down from heaven, some interpreters, uh, I was reading John MacArthur and his commentary, which is really excellent on this section, say that this is because this new Jerusalem already exists in heaven. Notice it doesn't say that God created this new Jerusalem, but that it actually descends from heaven to the new earth. So now when the Bible speaks about heavens, you have to understand the context and how the Bible uses the term. There's sort of three ways or three heavens, if you will. First, there's a heaven of what we would call the sky or the air, where the birds fly, where the airplanes fly. That's the atmosphere. Uh, the Bible sometimes uses the word heaven, and it's clearly a reference to what we would call the sky. Then there are the heavens, which are the abode of the planets and the stars. Now, to us, those heavens would be space, right? So, you know, we look and we see the galaxies, X many light years away, and so forth and so on, and so that would be the second heaven. So the third heavens, however, is the abode of God. And it's not like we can get in a spaceship and fly to God, that he's out there in that second heaven somewhere. It really is a different dimension. 
And I think there's biblical proof for that. If you recall, I was just reading this the other day, and so I don't have the reference at the top of my head, and it just came to my mind. But if you recall, uh, Elisha was predicting a victory uh, for the armies of God, and his follower didn't believe it, and he prayed, and he said, Lord, open his eyes, and all of a sudden he was able to see the armies of the angels surrounding the enemies of Israel. So in other words, he was, he, he was enlightened to another whole dimension of reality. This is what we see in the book of Revelation. John is caught up into heaven. It's not like he jumped in a spaceship and went through a wormhole and landed in some galaxy far, far away. No, it's that he was caught up into God's dimension, God's realm, which is somehow transcendent. So again, that this is this third realm, this third heaven. It's the realm of chapters 4 and 5. It's the realm of the cherubim, the 24 elders, the great angelic host, and all of the righteous dead who've come to life and dwell with God. So we need to remember that we will have resurrected bodies. Heaven for us will not be sitting around on clouds with harps. That sounds really boring to me. Okay, we are going to be in a city on some sort of physical plane, you know, on the new earth. It's going to be different. Our bodies are going to be different. Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 talks about the change of the mortal putting on immortality. We know that our maybe our resurrection bodies will be like Jesus' body. Jesus was able to, in his new resurrected body, uh, walk through walls to ascend up into the air. You know, he wasn't, he wasn't fixed down by the forces of gravity and so forth. He was able to eat. That's good news. So we're going to live in this new city, and it'll be described to us in tremendous detail in the latter part of chapter 21. It's going to be awesome. In fact, it reminds me of the story of an 85-year-old couple who'd been married for almost 60 years. And tragically, they died in the same moment in a car crash. But they had been in very good health for the last many years of their lives because the wife was very interested in health food and had always prepared and fixed nothing but good, healthy meals for the family and made sure that they both exercised and so forth. So when they finally reached the pearly gates, we'll see why they're called pearls, uh, shortly. St. Peter took them to their local mansion up in the New Jerusalem. And it was decked out with a beautiful kitchen, a beautiful master bath, suite, and a jacuzzi. And they, ooh, ah. And the old mass, and man asked Peter, how much is this going to cost? And Peter said, is it free? This is heaven. Next, they went out to survey the championship golf course that the house backed up to, you know? And they'd have golfing privileges every day, and each week the course changed into a new one, just manifesting the greatest golf courses on the planet. And the old man asked, what are the greens fees? And Peter replied, this is heaven, it's free. You play for free. And then they went into the clubhouse, and they saw this lavish buffet that you can't even believe. All the delicacies of the world's cuisines were laid out, and... The man again said, how much to eat here? And Peter said, this is heaven. It's free. And, you know, Peter was getting a little exasperated at this point in time. So the man said, well, where are the low fat and the low cholesterol tables? And Peter exclaimed, that's the best part. You can eat as much as you like of whatever you like, and you never get fat, and you never get sick. This is heaven. And then once he said that, the old man went into a fit of anger throw down his hat, stomped on it, shrieking wildly. And Peter and his wife both tried to calm him down, saying, what's the matter? The old man looked at his wife and said, this is all your fault. If it weren't for your blasted bran muffins, I'd have been here 10 years ago. <laughs> all right, I had to work that one in. 
Okay, it's going to be great. <laughs> and so, what we're going to get described is the glory of this new city, but we don't have a lot of detail about what we're going to be doing. The Bible does say we're going to be reigning with Christ throughout eternity, and that seems to imply something to do. You know, I think, I think that we'll be given jobs to do. We'll be given responsibilities to work out. We don't have a lot of detail on that, but remember the parable of the, of the talent, right? You know, and how the different responsibilities were doled out depending upon one's faithfulness. So now we have this new city coming down that's amazing, and we now see that God dwells with humanity. Verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. You see, that's the best part of this new world and this new city, is that we will be with God and he will be there with us. I think... The words of St. Augustine come to my mind. There's a God-shaped hole in our heart and that our hearts are restless until they find their home in him. And I just conflated two great quotes from church history. I'm sorry about that. Those of you online saying, that's not right. Blaise Pascal said, there's a God-shaped vacuum in everyone's heart. It was... Augustine, who said that our hearts are restless until we find our home in God. And I think the longer we live, the more we come to realize that all the things that this world offers us, whether it be family, marriage, uh, the joys of children and grandchildren, all the greatest things that we have in this world ultimately don't completely satisfy because it's not what we were truly created for. We were truly created to have fellowship with God and to be in that relationship with him and to praise and worship and enjoy him forever. If you learned anything about the Westminster Confession of Faith and the short catechism, you remember the first line, what is the chief end of man? Anybody know the answer to that? To glorify God, and I think the wording is to enjoy him forever. Uh, but worship and enjoyment, I think, are going to be one in heaven. So, um, that is going to be the thing that's most exciting about this is that God will be there with us. And what's going to happen? Well, all death, pain, and sorrow will have passed away. Verse 4, And he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. I was thinking about this this morning early. And I don't know about you, but I love stories with a happy ending. Right? I, I'm, I'm kind of a movie fan. I was actually born in North Hollywood. Maybe that explains it. But uh, I can't stand a movie that has one of those cynical endings that doesn't work out or the hero dies or, you know what I mean? I like the good old movies that have a happy ending. Well, here's our happy ending to those who are suffering, to those who have sorrow to those who've been victims of injustice, to those who've been abused, to those who've lost and had their lives cut short by violence, this is your hope. This is our hope that one day every tear will be gone. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more mourning, no more death. That's our happy ending. And after we've been there for 10,000 years, the pains and sorrows of this life will be long forgotten in the bliss of life in God's glorious presence. 
Amen? Amen? Oh, yeah. Bliss forever in God's heaven. It's cool. Amen? Amen. All right. It's pretty good for nine of you. Ten. Excuse me. Eleven, twelve. So we're growing. And then again, a reiteration. All things are new. Verse 5, and he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. I don't know about you, but I like new stuff. You like new stuff? As opposed to old stuff? Uh, new houses? I don't like new houses that don't have any landscaping, though, and you got to do all that work to put them in. But new houses with good landscaping, new cars. Oh, there's nothing like getting that new car, right? That smell as you get in the new car. New clothes, new gadgets. How about new everything, right? All things new. If the world we live in is cursed, imagine what the new creation will be. These are words from the throne. This is a promise of God himself, an assurance that his words are true and trustworthy. Notice it's the voice from he who sits on the throne says this. So these are the actual words of God as heard by John. See, I don't think we think enough about heaven and how wonderful it will be. This is kind of what, when I used to teach this, I used to just zip over this. In fact, when I was working on my notes for the class here, I had nothing written in here. I would just read it and say a couple things and move on in the next verses. But in reading and thinking about this in the last couple of weeks, I really am beginning to see how important this is. We get too caught up in this world. We don't think enough about heaven and how wonderful it'll be. And this is what is reflected in the scriptures. So let me give you a couple of examples. First John 2, 15 through 17. This is one we all know, I'm sure. Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world, and the world is passing away, and also its lust. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. See, we need to get our focus on heavenly things, and we're exhorted to do that um, in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things of earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you will also be revealed with him in glory. Now, this is one of those great theological truths in the Bible, and that is that a distinction between who we are in Christ and who we are in our experience. In Christ, we're seated with him in the heavenly places. In Christ, we're righteous and, and holy and redeemed. But in ourselves, in this world, we're sometimes less than holy. Here in this world, we can sometimes get focused on the worldly things and get our mind off of who we are truly. And so a lot of times the spiritual life is really all about getting our perspective into a heavenly perspective, to get our mindset on the things that are true spiritually about who we are. So keep seeking those things above. And then finally, God says, oop, that's already up there, I am the Alpha and the Omega, verse 6. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. We started at the beginning in the Bible and we've come to the end. We started at the beginning of the book, we've come to the end. But we're talking here about the existence. God is the beginning of everything 
And he is the end of it all. And the end comes as an eternity. Something that will go on and on and on. But God is the source and the promise of all of that. And here's another promise, another gospel promise. We're going to see this echoed several times throughout this last few verses of the book. And that is that come and drink from the waters of life for free. Come and find salvation. And so this next verse, verse 7, is a promise to the overcomers. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Deep in our hearts, I think, I know I feel like this sometimes, maybe you don't, but I still feel like a child. I know you're looking at me and saying, that's no child. Right? But don't we all feel like that? We, we still have those fears and insecurities we sometimes had as little children. We desire this intimate relationship with our fathers. Uh, I don't have a whole lot of memories from when I was a little boy, but I do remember having arguments with the neighborhood kids saying, my dad can beat up your dad. Remember those? Uh, you know, you have those kind of conversations because, you, you know, your dad was Superman. Your dad was just, he was great, and you wanted to brag on him. Uh, I remember one kid on our block who claimed his dad had a tank in his garage. Pretty hard to argue with your dad being cooler than that, you know. My dad's got a tank in the garage. Like, wow, you know, my dad doesn't have a tank. Of course, we didn't really believe him. We thought he was full of baloney, and he was. <laughs> but what happens as we grow up older is we find out that our fathers are not really supermen after all. They have faults. They have problems. Uh, some of them are huge disappointments, right? Uh, you know, some are abusive. Some become drunks. And some leave. And so deep in our souls, we're disillusioned and disappointed a lot of times in our own parents, and searching for that special relationship. Notice, you know, if you overcome, I will be your God and you will be my son. See? That's pretty cool. So we have, in this passage, we've got two illustrations, if you will, from two of the most intimate human relationships. We're going to talk a little bit about the bride to the husband relationship. That's going to be a critical part of the next passage. But here it's the son to the father relationship. So here there's going to be no disillusion with this father. If we remain faithful and are overcomers, and if you were in the beginning of the class, uh, we talked about this in detail. By the way, the plan is that once we finish the course or the class, we're going to, the next week, start in again and begin with chapter 1 and go up through uh, where we did in the physical class. And that way we'll have the entire class available on video. So um, if you missed those classes from before, you can just watch them as they come up. So it'll probably be another week or two before we finish. And then so sometime in mid-July, we'll probably start again at chapter one and go for a few weeks until we get, get up to chapter five. So there's no disappointment here. And if we are overcomers, and again, this is a theme in every church that Jesus gives a message to in chapter two and three, to the overcomer, to the one who perseveres to the end, he will be granted salvation and so forth. And here that promise is echoed one more time. We're promised to inherit all the blessings of heavenly citizenship. And this reminds me of what Paul said in Philippians 3, 20 through 21. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state 
into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of power, which he has even to subject all things to himself. Take. You know, again, that's not only a discussion about our citizenship in heaven, but also of the transformation of our bodies into bodies like Jesus's. So we're going to have these super duper bodies. And that's great. <laughs> you know, one of the worst things about getting old is stuff just stops working well. You know, it's like, man, I used to be able to bound down the stairs. Now I'm like going down the stairs like this and stuff. So this is the good news. We'll finally have the superhuman father we all desired when we were little. Someone we can love, trust, admire, and who will never let us down, who will always be there for us, always love us. You know, it's all we want when we're little children. That's the good news, but there's some bad news coming, and there's a warning. And there's a warning to the wicked in verse 8. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that, of, that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And so this is the bad news. Not everyone will be there. Over many years in ministry, I've done a lot of funerals. Unfortunately, a lot more funerals than weddings. Weddings are fun. Funerals, not so. Sometimes a funeral of someone that I didn't even know. There's, a couple, there's been a few times where a friend of mine who's a pastor couldn't do a funeral or whatever and just called me up and said, would you do this funeral for me? And I, I never even met the people. It's a sad occasion. We all want to hear a message of comfort. We all want to hear that everything's okay, that that person who's passed away is, quote, in a better place. Right? That's a lie that comes from the dragon, the serpent, Satan. We all have this fantasy that unless one is a really bad person, such as a racist slaver or a murderer or a drug dealer, or a politician. Did you get that one? <laughs> Just checking to see if you're awake there. That people are basically good, and everybody's going to go to heaven, because most people are good, right? Well, this is not what the Bible says. According to the Scriptures, only those who overcome by their faith will inherit these promises. Only those who wash their robes in the blood of the Lamb only those who put their faith and trust in the atoning blood of Jesus will be granted entrance into heaven. All others will be excluded and be residents in the lake of fire. Now, I don't like this. If it were up to me, if I was making the universe, I'd be, you know, like, well, we'll, we'll let you in after a while. But that's not what the Bible says. You do not want to go there. You don't have to go. Now, to the faithful here, I believe you're going to heaven. But I don't know who's listening out there online. You don't have to go. You say, but I'm a good person. Well, have you ever told a lie? Then you're a liar. Have you ever stolen anything? Then you're a thief. Have you ever gotten angry with someone or hated them? Well, Jesus taught us that that's the root of the sin of murder. Okay. So in your heart, you're a murderer. And the list goes on. We can talk about all of the commandments of God and how each and every one of us have broken those commandments and are sinners and stand condemned. That's what we talked about last week. You know, you don't want to stand before God at the great white throne and be judged according to your works because you're going to be found guilty and you're going to have to pay the penalty for your sin. Believing in this lie will send you to hell. Jesus has died on the cross for your sin. All you have to do is repent of your sin and turn to Christ for forgiveness of your sins and you'll receive forgiveness for those sins and the promise of eternal life. 
You don't want to go there. There's a warning here. Which, which side do you want to be on? You want to be an overcomer who washes his clothes in the blood of the Lamb, who gets the inheritance of heaven, where you can play on the golf course for free? I don't mean to make light of that. This is a serious decision. The Bible says, if you hear, do not harden your heart. Do not harden your heart against the gospel. Humble yourself and admit that you're a sinner. Humble yourself and say, Lord, I've walked away from you. I've turned my back on your, on your word, on your people. Forgive me and now bring me home. Forgive me of my sins. Put your trust in what Christ did on the cross for eternal life. That's all I've got for this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, that whoever might hear the words of my voice would hear this warning and would not come into judgment in the lake of fire. Pray that they would be inheritors of this great blessing of what we all longed for so deeply in our hearts, a relation with our Heavenly Father who loves us, cares for us, and will be with us for eternity. Father, help them to come to that. I pray and thank you for your word. I pray as we look in the next week or two at the beauties of heaven and the glories of where we'll spend eternity, that we will be excited about that and focus more on things of heaven rather than things on earth. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Goodbye and have a great afternoon. See you all next week.